The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Chapter 33, Tom and Huck Look for the Treasure in the Cave. Written by Mark Twain in 1876, read by Clay Shannon in 2020. Within a few minutes, the news had spread and a dozen skiff loads of men were on their way to McDougal's cave, and the ferryboat, well filled with passengers, soon followed. Tom Sawyer was in the skiff that bore Judge Thatcher. When the cave door was unlocked, a sorrowful sight presented itself in the dim twilight of the place. Injun Joe lay stretched upon the ground, dead, with his face close to the crack of the door, as if his longing eyes had been fixed to the latest moment upon the light and the cheer of the free world outside. Tom was touched, for he knew by his own experience how this wretch had suffered. His pity was moved, but nevertheless he felt an abounding sense of relief and security now, which revealed to him in a degree which he had not fully appreciated before how vast a weight of dread had been lying upon him since the day he lifted his voice against the bloody-minded outcast. Injun Joe's bowing knife lay close by, its blade broken in two. The great foundation beam of the door had been chipped and hacked through with tedious labor. Useless labor, too, it was, for the native rock formed a sill outside it, and upon that stubborn material the knife had wrought no effect. The only damage done was to the knife itself. But if there had been no stony obstruction there, the labor would have been useless still, for if the beam had been wholly cut away, Injun Joe could not have squeezed his body under the door, and he knew it. So he had only hacked that place in order to be doing something, in order to pass the weary time, in order to employ his tortured faculties. Ordinarily, one could find half a dozen bits of candle stuck around in the crevices of this vestibule left there by tourists, but there were none now. The prisoner had searched them out and eaten them. He had also contrived to catch a few bats, and these also he had eaten, leaving only their claws. The poor unfortunate had starved to death. In one place near at hand, a stalagmite had been slowly growing up from the ground for ages, builded by the water drip from a stalactite overhead. The captive had broken off the stalagmite, and upon the stump had placed a stone, wherein he had scooped a shallow hollow to catch the precious drop that fell once in every three minutes with the dreary regularity of a clock tick. A dessert spoonful once in four and twenty hours. That drop was fallen when the pyramids were new, when Troy fell, when the foundations of Rome were laid, when Christ was crucified, when the conqueror created the British Empire, when Columbus sailed, when the massacre at Lexington was news. It is fallen now. It will still be fallen when all these things shall have sunk down the afternoon of history and the twilight of tradition and been swallowed up in the thick night of oblivion. As everything a purpose and a mission, did this drop fall patiently during five thousand years to be ready for this flitting human insect's need? And has it another important object to accomplish ten thousand years to come? No matter. It is many and many a year since the hapless half-breed scooped out the stone to catch the priceless drops, but to this day the tourist stares longest at that pathetic stone and that slow drop in the water when he comes to see the wonders of MacDougall's cave. Injun Joe's cup stands first in the list of the cavern's marvels. Even Aladdin's palace cannot rival it. 
Injun Joe was buried near the mouth of the cave, and people flocked there in boats and wagons. From the towns and from all the farms and hamlets for seven miles around, they brought their children and all sorts of provisions, and confessed that they had had almost as satisfactory a time at the funeral as they could have had at the hanging. This funeral stopped the further growth of one thing, the petition to the governor for Injun Joe's pardon. The petition had been largely signed, many tearful and eloquent meetings had been held, and a committee of sappy women been appointed to go in deep mourning and wail around the governor and implore him to be a merciful ass and trample his duty underfoot. Injun Joe was believed to have killed five citizens of the village, but what of that? If he had been Satan himself, there would have been plenty of weaklings ready to scribble their names to a pardon petition and drip a tear on it from their permanently impaired and leaky waterworks. The morning after the funeral, Tom took Hook to a private place to have an important talk. Hook had learned all about Tom's adventure from the Welshman and the widow Douglas by this time. But Tom said he reckoned there was one thing they had not told him. That thing was what he wanted to talk about now. Hook's face saddened. He said, I know what it is. You got into number two and never found anything but whiskey. Nobody told me it was you, but I just knowed it must have been you soon as I heard about that whiskey business. And I knowed you hadn't got the money because you'd have got at me some way or other and told me, even if you was mum to everybody else. Tom, something's always told me we'd never get hold of that swag. Why, Huck, I never told on that tavern keeper. You know his tavern was all right the Saturday I went to the picnic. Don't you remember you was to watch there that night? Oh, yes. Why, it seems about a year ago. It was that very night that I followed Injun Joe to the Witters. You followed him? Yes, but you keep mum. I reckon Injun Joe's left friends behind him, and I don't want him souring on me and doing me mean tricks. If it hadn't been for me, he'd be down in Texas now, all right. Then Huck told his entire adventure in confidence to Tom, who had only heard of the Welshman's part of it before. Well, said Huck, presently coming back to the main question, who ever nipped the whiskey and number two nipped the money too, I reckon. Anyway, it's a goner for us, Tom. Huck, that money wasn't ever in number two. What? Huck searched his comrade's face keenly. Tom, have you got on the track of that money again? Huck, it's in the cave. Huck's eyes blazed. Say it again, Tom. The money's in the cave. Tom, honest engine now. Is it fun or earnest? Earnest, Huck. Just as earnest as ever I was in my life. Will you go in there with me and help get it out? I bet I will. I will, if it's where we can blaze our way to it and not get lost. Huck, we can do that without the least little bit of trouble in the world. Good as wheat. What makes you think the money's... Huck, you just wait till we get in there. If we don't find it, I'll agree to give you my drum and everything I've got in the world. I will, by jings. All right, it's a whiz. When do you say? Right now, you say. Are you strong enough? Is it far in the cave? I've been on my pins a little, three or four days now. But I can't walk more than a mile, Tom. Huh? At least I don't think I could. It's about five mile into there, the way anybody but me would go. Huck. But there's a mighty short cut that they don't anybody but me know about. Huck, I'll take you right to it in a skip. I'll float the skip down there and I'll pull it back again all by myself. You need never turn your hand over. 
Let's start right off, Tom. All right. We want some bread and meat and our pipes and a little bag or two and two or three kite strings and some of these newfangled things they call Lucifer matches. I tell you, many is the time I wished I had some when I was in there before. A trifle afternoon, the boys borrowed a small skiff from a citizen who was absent and got under way at once. When they were several miles below Cave Holler, Tom said, Now you see this bluff here looks all alike all the way down from the Cave Holler. No houses, no wood yards, bushes all alike. But do you see that white place up yonder where there's been a landslide? Well, that's one of my marks. We'll get ashore now. They landed. Now, Huck, where we're a standing, you could touch that hole I got out of with a fishing pole. See if you can find it. Huck searched all the place about and found nothing. Tom proudly marched into a thick clump of sumac bushes and said, Here you are. Look at it, Huck. It's the snuggest hole in this country. You just keep mum about it. All along, I've been wanting to be a robber, but I knew I'd got to have a thing like this, and where to run across it was the bother. We got it now, and we'll keep it quiet. Only we'll let Joe Hopper and Ben Rogers in, because, of course, there's got to be a gang, or else there wouldn't be any style about it. Tom Sawyer's gang. Sounds splendid. Don't it, Huck? Well, it just does, Tom. And who'll we rob? Almost anybody. Waylay people. That's mostly the way. And kill him? No, not always. Hide them in the cave till they raise a ransom. What's a ransom? Money. You make them raise all they can, often their friends. And after you've kept them a year, if it ain't raised, then you kill them. That's the general way. Only you don't kill the women. You shut up the women, but you don't kill them. They're always beautiful and rich and awfully scared. You take their watches and things, but you always take your hat off and talk polite. They ain't anybody as polite as robbers. You'll see that in any book. Well, the women get to loving you, and after they've been in the cave a week or two weeks, they stop crying and after that, you couldn't get them to leave. If you drove them out, they'd turn right around and come back. It's so, in all the books. Why, it's real bully, Tom. I believe it's better than to be a pirate. Yes, it's better in some ways, because it's close to home and circuses and all that. By this time, everything was ready and the boys entered the hole, Tom in the lead. They toiled their way to the farther end of the tunnel, then made their spliced kite strings fast and moved on. A few steps brought them to the spring, and Tom felt a shudder quiver all through him. He showed Huck the fragment of candlewick perched on a lump of clay against the wall, and described how he and Becky had watched the flames struggle and expire. The boys began to quiet down to whispers now, for the stillness and gloom of the place oppressed their spirits. They went on, and presently entered and followed Tom's other corridor until they reached the jumping-off place. The candles revealed the fact that it was not really a precipice, but only a steep clay hill twenty or thirty feet high. Tom whispered, Now I'll show you something, Huck. He held his candle aloft and said, Look as far around the corner as you can. Do you see that there on the big rock over yonder? Done with candle smoke. Tom, it's a cross. Now where's your number two? Under the cross, hey? Right yonder's where I saw Injun Joe poke up his candle, Huck. Huck stared at the mystic sign a while and then said with a shaky voice, Tom, let's get out of here. What, and leave the treasure? 